On Friday, October the 31st, 1919, the Ketch Corinthian and the Ketch Glenarvan, loaded with phosphates, set sail together in a freshening northeast breeze from the port of Antwerp, bound for London. Captain Leake was happy that the 27-year-old craft, the Corinthian, was not overloaded, and the 160 tonnes of fertiliser did not impair her seagoing qualities. He and the mate discussed how they were going to share the four-hour watches with his crew, which comprised of a seaman and a ship's boy. The able seaman was a seasoned hand. However, the boy, a 16-year-old from Hackney in the east end of London, was on his first voyage. Captain Leake was determined to keep his eye on the youngster. He had noticed that the brash teenager had plenty to say for himself, though he seemed to be a quick learner. A smile crept over the captain's face as he wondered how many clips around the ears the lad would receive from the mate and AB for any mistakes the lad made. He, however, would not tolerate any unnecessary bullying. As they cleared the shoal waters of the Belgium coastline, the wind freshened to a blustery east-northeast and by midday had reached gale force. A sudden gust blew away the mizzen sail in the worsening weather. Ernest Leake decided to make a run for it to Dover. The main sheet parted as they hauled up on the East Goodwin lightship. It was seven o'clock in the evening and with the mainsail blown out of control, the Corinthian became unmanageable. Leake knew he was drifting towards the Goodwin sands and was hastening to get a new mainsail ready to hoist when they struck the sands. In an instant, the mizzen mast was ripped out and toppled overboard. The catch started to take in water. Captain Leake went below, gathered up some bedding and a paraffin lamp and then hurried his crew aloft into the rigging. With huge seas sweeping over her deck, the Corinthians settled on the Goodwins, with only her mast showing above the raging sea. The crew were now secure in the rigging. Captain Leake set light to the blankets. A signal of distress was quickly observed by the vigilant men on the light vessels, who, at a quarter to ten, started to fire rockets and their signal guns to alert those ashore. From the shore, the pyrotechnic display from all three light ships was a sight to behold in the darkness. This would be a tragic night to remember for Cox and William Adams. At 10.30, the North Dill lifeboat the Charles Dibdin slid down the beach and into the surf. The light vessels had stopped firing after they had received a response from the shore. Little did the captain of the shipwreck Corinthian know that he had summoned the lifeboat out to save lives from another craft that was in distress, the Tugu. Leek waited in the rigging, shouting words of encouragement to his crew, assuring his men that it was only a matter of time before they would be saved. The hours went by. Every time a wave raked along the semi-submerged hull, the mast swayed dangerously, as the main, fore and jib sails were still set. These were jeopardising the stability of the mainmast. Captain Leake felt the pangs of hunger, as they had not eaten since six that morning. Worst of all was the coldness which consumed their wet bodies. His desire for a smoke seemed to fill his mind. Thankfully, obliterating the thought that he may never see his wife and young son again. They suffered on for eight long bitter hours. The ship's lad was in tears and no amounts of encouragement shouted to him helped. At six in the morning, the lad's ordeal came to an end. With a pitiful scream, he released his hold from the rigging and plunged headlong into the fury of the waves below, never to be seen again. Sadness, as well as the biting wind, filled their eyes with tears. In despair, the master of the doomed catch could not comprehend why I had not been rescued before now by the lifeboat. It was almost seven o'clock in the morning when the North Deal lifeboat came ashore. The coxswain, William Adams, was helped out of the lifeboat, along with the two rescued seamen from the Tugu. John Pryor, the lifeboat secretary and agent for Shipwreck Mariner Society, informed the weary Adams that more wrecks had been sighted. In the weak light of dawn, two shipwrecks were visible on the skyline amidst the grey swirling sea. Adam's heart fell. However, he was in such pain from the injury that he had sustained in the lifeboat, he knew he could not render further assistance. Pryor reluctantly appealed to William Stanton, the reserve lifeboat coxswain, to relaunch the Charles Dibdin and assist the casualties. Stanton was gravely ill with throat cancer and was awaiting entry into hospital for an operation, but did not falter in his reply and called out for fresh volunteers to take the lifeboats off those injured or fatigued from the Tugu rescue. At 7.30 the lifeboat relaunched. This would be Stanton's last ever lifeboat rescue. There was no let up in the weather. 
these northeast winds seem to be getting worse. Meanwhile, on the Corinthian, their hands numb with cold, Captain Leek helped secure the other two crewmen onto the rigging with ropes. The mate was now barely conscious and was delirious with exhaustion. As Captain Leek strained his bloodshot eyes over the horizon for deliverance, he came across the sad sight of the Ketch Glenarvan, which was in a similar predicament to them, with all of the crew hanging onto the rigging. The lifeboat battled against the seas and wind for seven hours before they reached the wreck of the Corinthian, which was but six and a half miles from the shore. There was little conversation amongst Leek's men, as their will to live was fading fast, while they clung to the fragile mainmast, Leek still scanned the bleak, spume-filled sea for salvation. This eventually came in the vision of the Charles Dibbin, rolling violently below them. Ernest Leek's first concern was for his mate, the young George Green. His condition was becoming critical, and Leek urged him to tie the rope, which was thrown from the lifeboat, about himself. With what little strength the man had, he laboriously looped the rope under his arms and secured it with a bowline knot. The fatigued captain then commanded him to release his hold from the rigging to enable the lifeboat crew to pull him to safety. Green's nerves were at breaking point. With what little courage he had left, he let go of the rope ladder that had supported him over the last 17 hours. As the lifeboat crew hauled the mate towards them, he came foul of a thick rope shroud which was bracing up the mainmast. The unfortunate man's mind finally snapped and he held onto the rope with all his remaining strength. No matter how much the lifeboat crew pleaded with him to let go, he would not obey. Leek even risked his own life by climbing down to him and then tried to prise the poor man's fingers apart from the rope. The men held on in a death grip and with sadness the captain left him as he died with salvation mere yards away. The able seaman and Leek were assisted into the role in Charles Dibdin, and after another 25 minutes of pulling, the battered dead body of the mate was hauled aboard. Captain Leake explained that the crew of the other ketch, the Glenarvan, had perished earlier. Cox and Stanton decided to make for the shore with due haste. On that dismal afternoon, half past three, the lifeboat was hauled up the beach. The two survivors of the Corinthian were ushered into the nearby public house, the Forester, for dry clothes and a hot drink. Captain Ernest Leake met John Pryor, the agent for Shipwreck Mariners. Little did he know that he would make Pryor's acquaintance again four years later when he would once more be rescued by the lifeboat.